Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, I, a couple of things I'm going to say before I introduce this is that um, I'm going to take this opportunity to, yes, wrap up one of the projects that I've been doing here, but also it's not completely done. There's still, I'm still waiting for some data to come back. So what I'm going to present are preliminary findings, and I'm really kind of excited to do that because it means I still have time to make this better or different or go in a different direction. So I really invite feedback, and that could be afterwards or during the talk. If I say something you want me to elaborate, um, I do have a lot more information than I think are like up here, so please just stop and you know interrupt if you want to. So, all right. Um, so the title of this presentation is "You're the Manager, but I'm the Mayor: Understanding Foursquare Check-ins in Claimed Venues." And I'm Jermaine Halegwa, but you guys know that already. Um, so what I wanted to investigate with this, and I'll elaborate a little bit on some of the questions that I asked here was about the information flows between customers and vendors over location-based systems, in particular Foursquare. So I'll explain a little bit also what a claimed venue is. But a claimed venue is basically a store or a restaurant or a bar or a library or any sort of institution or building or retail shop that um, opts into the Foursquare system. So it's anybody can put a venue up online or up on the Foursquare system to be checked into. But these are um, venues that were claimed by the manager or the owner in order to offer specials back to the customer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how that works. So the overview for this talk, it's only going to be a half hour long, so I'll try and be mindful of the time. Um, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Foursquare and how it works for those of you who don't use it or don't know how it works. And then a little bit of an overview of the study and the research questions that I wanted to ask and attempted to answer. And then a little bit about preliminary findings and then offer some um, conclusions about what all of this might mean or where to go from there. So first, looking at um, the Foursquare system. So the way that it works, it came out in around 2009. It was open to the public by Dennis Crowley and Naveen. I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, but um, Salvadurai, is that how you say it? Um, but the first incarnation of this was a system called Dodgeball. And that was a um, SMS-based system on your cell phone where you could announce your location <laughs> Um, to your friends or the people who are in your network. And that is very much kind of how this works as well. So a lot of the dominant uses of that system carried on to Foursquare. And this is an example of what the interface looks like on an iPhone system. So up in this top corner, we see um, that you could check in. So the way this is is the location announcement system. You have a pre-established network of friends that you've chosen who also opted into Foursquare. And you check in at various places where you go throughout the city or throughout your town to announce to them that this is where you are. So now um, the interface looks a bit different. Back then when this picture was taken, I took it off the internet, um, you could only shout. And a shout would be that if you checked in and you wanted to add some sort of annotation about why you were in this place or something like that, you could shout to your network of friends as well. You could even shout without checking in. Now you could add pictures. You can comment on your check-in. So there's a little bit more interpersonal interaction there, too. As you can see, also, you could see where your friends are at. So you get a list of where your friends are at. You also get a list of how many points you've acquired. So there's a gaming aspect to the system as well. When you check in and um, other people that you're friends with on the network check in as well, you get a certain number of points. If you check into a new place, you get a certain number of points. So there is sort of a reward system in place that allows you to accrue points by checking in at various locations, sometimes because they're new, sometimes because somebody else is there, sometimes because you unlocked a badge, which I'll talk about in a second. So there is a leaderboard of all your friends and where they stand in the standings of how many points they have. Also, you have the opportunity to become the mayor of a certain location. And that means you've checked into that location, you've been to that location more, than any, more frequently than any other person. So it kind of um, gives you this connotation that you own this space in some way, at least digitally. And you also have the option of seeing who is present in the space along with you. Um, and here is an illustration of the places function. When you kind of say that you want to check in, it'll give you a list of places that are in your immediate area, and you could check in there as well. 
Um, so again, this is very much about location. And there's a lot of conversation going on, even among users that I talk to, whether this is a game or whether this is something else. So it's definitely a location-based social media system. Whether it's a game or not is something we could talk about a little bit later. But there are, again, virtual rewards for your being somewhere for social interaction with place or things like that. And these are badges. And these are some of the examples of what badges look like. And one of the badges up here that I want to call attention to is the oversharer badge, which is kind of interesting, um, because that is a discourse that's circulating around these systems, that these unwitting users overshare or share too much information, like their personal location, which should be private information, or information that could be used against you by unwanted parties. So um, in this case, the overshare badge, you get it if you announce your location, 10 different locations within 12 hours or something like that. So it's kind of, you get rewarded for oversharing in a sense. But what I really want to focus on here, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about how that system works, is the venue stats page, which came out in 2010. So like I mentioned before, you have the option as the owner or the manager of a certain venue to claim that venue. And by claiming it, you're opting into the system and you're offering specials to anyone who checks in. So I've claimed the Microsoft Research New England venue. And that's the stats page that we're seeing right now. So the purpose of the venue stats page, obviously, pretty obviously, is to offer analytics to the person who's managing the account. These are not public analytics. It's only to the person who has the password for this account. So um, according to certain press releases and interviews um, with Foursquare managers, not individual managers like me, but the idea but the people who set this up. The idea behind the stats page was for a venue to learn about people who checked in on Foursquare and reward them for their patronage. And thus, their use of location-based system is kind of consequential there. Um, or coordinates there. If a loyal customer stops checking in, you could find out why and offer them incentives to come back. You could monitor who checks in and who's new and say hi to them via Twitter and say, oh, what kind of food do you like? Welcome. I'm glad you're new here. So it's supposed to encourage some sort of interaction as well as give you some analytical data about who is checking in. Um, as well. But what is also particularly interesting about this system is that you can see who is there. You could see your customers, you could see the people who check in, and if they link their Foursquare page or they link their Foursquare account to Twitter or Facebook, you could also access um, Twitter or Facebook sometimes. Just the other day I was testing it out, and you could, if you click on the handle of someone like Kate, who is currently the mayor, even though I am one of the top visitors, which kind of bothers me a little bit, um, <laughs> you can see her Twitter feed, you can see her friends, you can see what she talks about, and um, I think she also had a link to her Facebook page, so you could kind of access more information about her there. So there's a lot of information to be had through the Foursquare system, a lot of seemingly personal information as well. So some of the discourses, before I get into the questions I wanted to ask about the system, that circulate about Foursquare or are currently circulating is one that location-based, and LBS I've abbreviated as location-based system, right, or location-based social media. That LBS is an emerging trend within social media networks or social networking sites. That it's something that is the up-and-coming cutting-edge sort of way to use um, social networking sites. And Facebook and Twitter have also uh, had uh, LBS sort of interaction there. They've had places, too. So these are separate systems, or they're being incorporated into systems that we already use. There's also this discourse that people who opt into these systems are dupes in some way, that they're unwitting overshares that engage in risky business by announcing their personal presence within a given city. Right. So this idea, and I showed in my intern talk a little bit um, a couple weeks ago, please rob me. Right. So this idea that if you announce where you are, somebody could follow you within the city in a stalking sort of unwanted way or they could go to your house because your house is empty if you're at MSR and they could rob you right so this sort of discourse that announcing this sort of private information is actually really dangerous to you physically as well and finally one of the things that also has come out of this idea that LBS is an emerging trend, is this idea of locational privacy. And the way that locational privacy has been defined, at least by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is the ability of an individual to move in public space with the expectation that under normal circumstances, their location 
will not be systematically and secretly recorded for later use. And a lot of this locational privacy debate or this idea that we might be losing our locational privacy, this is something that, a privilege that we've had, but now is kind of being dissipated by the fact that we carry on us a lot of location-aware devices. So what um, a lot of what the EFF is concerned with are these systems like Foursquare, which are generally opt-in, they give notice, they give consent to so, in some sense to what the user is agreeing to, but also the fact that your cell phone, as you carry it around, it can track your location and report it back to the cell phone operators or something like that. So this idea that your uh, location could also be secretly sort of tracked without you knowing. But this idea that these systems that maybe secretly track your location or automatically track your location, like your cell phone when you have it on, and these systems that you opt in for various reasons are lumped together in a lot of debate about locational privacy and a lot of policies that are coming out about locational privacy. And this is a concern for me because I think there's still a lot to be known about the way that we use these LBS systems, right? these location-based social media systems that don't always coordinate with the way that um, the technological standards say that we should use these systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But some of the things that have come out to regulate the way that um, different uh, internet services or different cell phone services collect our information of the CTIA best practices and guidelines for LBS. So that lumps together definitely um, stuff like Foursquare with location tracking unbeknownst to us, right? Um, the sen senators Franken and Blumenthal put out a Locational Privacy Protection Act this year. In the past two years, we've also seen other privacy bills, online privacy and security bills, that have addressed location-based systems. But what I'm kind of arguing here is that it's not always about the technology. It's also about the social interaction. And the, the issues that surround maybe the social interaction or social mediation of privacy might be different than just the automatic sort of um, accumulation and storage of your data versus vi like via these sort of technological apparatuses. So I think there's a lot more to be looked at in the way that privacy and location work on systems that we opt into for various reasons. So some of the questions that I want to address here, that I tried to address here, were for one, what are the relationships that are forged between vendors and customers on LBS? And one of the things that I wanted, one of the reasons I wanted to look at this is because a lot of those policies that I threw up there before are really meant to regulate not just the security of the individual's location and kind of hold that down and lock that down and keep that anonymized or private, but also that they're making claims in these bills about the ways that commercial enterprises use your location based data. And I think that some of the claims, although they might be accurate for bigger companies or larger enterprises, they might not prove true for the smaller venue, vendor or venue or the local business. And we have to kind of consider that as well if this is going to regulate all of these entities under um, the same sort of regulation or policy. So I really want to get at, well, what are these actual relationships that happen with commercial enterprises? What sort of information are they garnering from our location information? And how are they using that to make decisions? Um, but also, I want to see how vendors and participants understand their own participation in these systems. Why do they participate? What is their motivation? How do they see their relationship with vendors happening over these systems? How do they see the relationships with each other and with place happening over these systems as well? So in addition to this, I'm kind of also examining or looking at what's the value of location for each of these parties, which links to a lot of the other work that I've done previously with my dissertation, asking what is the place of place? What is the place of physical place? within these digital networks? What does place mean to people within a city or otherwise? And then finally, I wanted to look at, well, vendors and participants, what are their views of privacy and monitoring? Do they have certain strategies? Do they have certain concerns that are or are not being accounted for in policy and just in the way that we discuss those unwitting oversharers or the way that we're using location over these social networks or not using location over these social networks? So then very, very quickly, very briefly, I want to talk a little bit about some of the literature that has come out that might help us get to know what's being said about location-based social networks and issues of privacy. So some of the, some of the um, studies that have come out since 2007 really try to map out a taxonomy of general use of these systems. And just to give you some idea of what this general use looks like, um, Humphrey's looking at Dodgeball, Linguist at all looking at um, specifically Foursquare, Kramer looking at Foursquare, Looped, and other systems as well. But what they find is very similar, that there's a huge myriad of reasons why people use these technologies. 
So some of these reasons, just to give you kind of a quick rundown, is for personal tracking or self-quantification, knowing where you've been, knowing your own patterns, um, intimate sharing with friends at a distance, discovery of new people, running into friends on the go, so spontaneous interactions, seeing where your friends have been, so sort of this social surveillance monitoring aspect to that. Highlight non-routine places that you might visit, announce when you're at large events, find other people when you're at large events, discover new places, map your location history, show off if you're somewhere that you haven't been before or somewhere unique, kill time, they do it for the gaming aspects, for the discounts, for the tips. Um, one participant mentioned something about that this might be a good promotional strategy for businesses, um, but they did find that people did check in for safety purposes as well, which kind of throws a little kink in the plans that people are doing this for um, reasons that are unsafe. But anyway, I would add to that from my interviews that people also do this because they see themselves as a perceived expert and they want to share knowledge. Um, they share or promote their online identity that carries across from other social networking sites. It's conversation starters for people they already know to show others that they're doing okay. So beyond that safety element, sort of just to say, well, you know, you might know about my life right now and it's not going so well, but if I start checking into, you know, other places and things like that, you might kind of see that I'm not sort of holed up in my apartment depressed or something. So a way for other people to check in on them was one of the ways that they used location. So the point here being that they use it for a lot of different reasons, right? And as we'll see, a lot of these reasons do not involve vendors directly. So very few people actually said that they use this system for discounts or tips or something like that. Um, as far as disclosure and non-disclosure goes, a lot of um, these people mentioned here have found that the audience as well as the situation is a determinant for when people disclose information about the, their location. And what um, I'm building on here are people who have mentioned that if they don't know who's asking, or more so if they don't know why that person is asking them where their location or why they're where where they are, they might not answer. They'll feel less involved or they feel less motivated to disclose. And the last sort of aspect of the literature review that I want to talk briefly about is uh, privacy concerns as a barrier for adoption. And a lot of people found this not to be true. They found that um, if you find a system useful, that you'll have less privacy concerns. If you don't find the system useful, you'll have more privacy concerns. Other people have found that the more people use location-based systems, the more they become familiar with the privacy settings, the more they feel that they have some sort of control over the way that their location is used. So while privacy concerns still exist, there is sort of um, this, the research has shown that it's not really a barrier for adoption, that even if you start out with privacy concerns, you might abandon them a little bit later. So it's a kind of an interesting contradiction in a lot of the um, information that we have about privacy concerns over location-based systems. There's certain people saying that you know some people did find uh, stalking to be a high priority when prompted to answer a question about stalking. Other people finding like it's not that big a deal and people engage with these systems over time and become less sort of concerned about their privacy. So these are sort of the three main categories I think I'm building on a little bit and maybe some others that I haven't found yet. So another question that we could ask is also why Foursquare? And I think um, in particular what drew me to this was that it is a very, very popular um, system that's being used, right? So that it, ha it just reached, they announced 10 million users or surpassed 10 million users. And um, I think we're at a moment with Foursquare that we're getting a little bit beyond the early adopter and going into a more democratized use of the system, if we want to call it that. Or we're seeing a lot more variety in the use that isn't just from the early adopter segment of the population. So the way I went about doing this study was looking at background. I did a, I did a background questionnaire and a 45 minute, which usually ended at about like an hour and a half long, semi-structured interview. So I was doing an ethnography of both vendors and participants. They were recruited via meetup sites for Foursquare, um, through signs in given locations. I had third party um, developers sites that tracked where the specials were and I contacted those vendors individually. So a lot of sort of outreach to try and get a general population. Um, the interviews were asking them again about privacy concerns, general use, and also what's the meaning of location within these systems for you. I did participant observation, which meant that I was also participating in Foursquare, and what I'm calling user observation, so I friended my participants both on Twitter and on Foursquare, especially if they linked their Foursquare to the Twitter to kind of see if what they were telling me was actually what they were doing, and often it was. I ended up with eight vendors and 10 participants or customers, and 
And then I also attended two seminars on the use of social media for business. One focused on location-based systems. The other was run by a location-based social media service that talked about how small businesses and local businesses should use Foursquare, or should use social media in general. So I've decided to kind of map my findings, and this is something that maybe we could talk more about, into four different themes. So first, um, I found that a lot of people wanted to talk about the meaning of location. I'm going to kind of present what I found with that from both sides. And then vendor and customer social media relationships. So what are the business interactions that actually happen over these systems? And what are some of the power and control issues that happen around those interactions? Privacy concerns and strategies, do they exist? If so, what are they? How are they managed? And then finally, what are the relationships between physical space and online space? Or what is the bridging point? Or what are these moments where physical and online sort of become hybridized or intermixed in some way? And that's something I'm still kind of making sense of, but I'll give you a little inkling of what I found. So the first thing I want to do is start with a story about the meaning of location. And it's a much longer quote than what appears here, so I want to um, kind of read that quote to you as well. So this quote that I'm going to the story that I'm going to tell is something that was actually repeated several times over the course of my doing my research. And it was the CEO of a certain regional chain out of Boston, but also covering New England. So they have, I think, about 17 stores. And he was at a panel, and he was asked, what is the value of location, or what is the importance of location in social media? And this is what he responded. So, and this is just a segment of the quote, but social media really helped us begin to go away from one on one interaction with guests on email and phone. And where I first realized where location was more important than I originally thought was actually an incident a couple years ago where a woman on Twitter, I think prior to Foursquare, tweeted about an experience she was having at that moment in our Boston Common location about the music being too loud. I happened to be driving on 89. I was not looking at my phone, but somehow I saw that and I picked up the phone and I called the manager at the Boston Common location and I said, would you mind doing me a favor? Turn down the music and uh, get a cookie and bring it out to the woman who's probably on her phone and she's got dark hair. And I pulled over and I tweeted, done. And she went crazy and she had a bunch of followers, probably like 10,000. And that's when I realized that there's probably something here. So I don't know about you, but when I listen to that, right, this is something that he said during a location-based social media panel. This was something that I read in a book about uh, social media, something that was repeated on a blog, at least one, about social media, and then finally was repeated back to me um, by somebody who worked at a location-based social media company about the value of location within social media. So if we did listen to that story, what does it say about location? Kind of nothing, right? So he kind of even switches at the very beginning and says, well, social media really helped me do this. So I began to wonder, well, why is this being repeated as sort of like a mantra of location when it's really about customer service, right? It's really about customer experience. It's about reaching out and responding to customers, right? It's about listening to what they have to say at a distance. Maybe there's something about telepresence or co-presence, but there's really nothing about location. So as I kind of went through all my interviews and as I was kind of listening to stories um, and hearing this repeated over and over again, I realized two things. So one is that for vendors, the meaning of location is kind of unknown. They're really unsure about what the importance of location is. But they see a great importance about getting into this as soon as possible, that there is some sort of um, benefit for being an early adopter, and that location-based systems are read as cutting edge, they're read as innovative, we should get on it, and that will sort of reflect maybe on our back-end technology as being cutting edge edge and innovative. So sort of like, we're not sure what it does yet, but we're going to jump on it. That's one thing. And also, I asked a lot of people directly who were social media consultants or social media experts, you know, what is the value of location-based social media? And they blatantly would say, you should get on that as soon as possible, but I don't really know yet, right? We don't really know why. So this was an interesting moment for me, um, considering when I'm going to get into the customer relationship as well. But also, what's interesting is that from that CEO's comment, right, that he doesn't really know how to make sense of it. But the way he chooses to make sense of it is with the mantra of listening and responding. And this idea of listening and responding over social networks is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later, because I think there's a power and control exchange that's happening there as well. 
So they're kind of not sure what to make of location-based media. They're lumping it in with the strategies that they've been told to use over and over again with other social media systems, even if it doesn't quite work. So the customer perspective, on the other hand, is very different. They know exactly what location is supposed to mean in any given moment, right? And it's very context specific. But they have all these varied ways in which location matters, a lot of which maps onto what Humphreys found, a lot of which maps onto what other people have found as well, that list that I read at the very beginning. But what was particularly interesting to me, other than the fact that they have this varied idea of all the different ways that it matters, is that none of their ways ever included vendors. When I would ask them, why is this important? Why is this valuable? Most of them would say, well, I never ever claim the discounts, right? I don't use this to form connections with vendors. I use this to form connections with friends. So it is definitely a space for customers where vendors don't belong in some weird way, right? They see also, and this is something that stood out a lot, the city becomes a place of encounters, right? And this is something that I'm borrowing from um, Lefebvre, but a place of encounters with new places, a way to explore new places and connect with old people. So it also kind of frames this idea of the old place or the place that you go all the time maybe is not something that gets represented on Foursquare, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's not something that you want to use Foursquare for or to connect with because um, you already presumably have some sort of relationship with that place, but also you're not using it to meet new people. You're not using it to make connections with people outside of your immediate network that you've opted into including already. So that was kind of interesting too. Um, but also what kind of fits back to that idea of disclosure, why people disclose or choose not to disclose over location-based systems, is that customers are actually very unsure about what vendors would do with their location information. And it makes them very wary of this. So we have this moment also where the vendor becomes kind of the unexpected audience that's kind of out there, but also that even if they had our information, I'm not quite sure what they would do with it. So they're sort of, they have this moment where it's kind of okay if they listen in, but I don't want them to act on it in any way. And I could talk a little bit more about that too. So just to kind of push this further that people don't really know what to do with this, like vendors at least, is um, taken from one of the social media seminars, and I'll just go through this quickly, but they're kind of going on, well, you know, what, and they recognize that vendors kind of have no place here, right? So they have this idea that um, you shouldn't maybe offer them offer the mayor some sort of discount because it's a waste of time. That's not really what they want. So there is this recognition that they want to use these systems for reasons that don't concern you. But there's also this motivation, well, how do we get in there? How do we get in on what's happening? Because something big is happening. We just don't know what it is yet. Um, and because they don't know what it is, there's another really interesting thing that happens. And it happens in their construction of who the location-based user is. And this is something that I heard in various ways, not just in this one seminar. But because they can't make sense of what the user is getting out of location and why it doesn't concern them, they kind of demonize the user in a lot of different ways. And the worst possible thing they could think of is to call them a gamer and to have these sort of things that come up around gamers. So I don't know if you could see that, but gamers in particular epitomize this statement that they are selfish, lazy, and ruthless, right? That they want to only get to the next level or achievement or kill streak, that um, they're lazy since they just want to get through the gameplay as much and optimize uh, as much optimization and many exploits and cheats as possible. And everything that they kind of constructed around the LBS user is like that they are kind of forward thinking in some ways, but they're sort of dupes. They're easily manipulable, but we just haven't figured out how to do it yet. Or they're kind of hard or difficult to engage, and maybe we should find or work together to find some way to engage them or just kind of let them go by the wayside. So there's all these different conflicting ideas about who the game, who the location based user is, but there was this interesting streak of the demonization of that user because they don't really know what to do with them um, or harness them. And again, they put forth this idea that you just kind of plan and deal with them according to the way that you've dealt with other social media networks all along, which is basically listening and then responding and targeting influencers in some way. When it comes to vendor-customer relationships then, how does that kind of work. Well, the way that they've been trained is what I found by going to these social media seminars. The way that vendors are being told to interact with their customers is through listening, responding, earning content, and rewarding, right? So that 
the first thing you should always do in any situation is listen and always respond, no matter what the person is saying. Um, and then earning content and rewarding kind of go hand in hand as well. So earning content was a term, or earned content was a term that was carried through a lot of my conversations with vendors in one way or another. And this was the idea that earned content was content you didn't pay for, but can be used to sort of publicize your brand. So this is the idea of crowdsourcing. This is the idea of kind of putting out a question over Facebook or Twitter and getting lots of different responses that then gains you some sort of visibility or tells you what sort of sprinkles to put on your ice cream at this big event that's happening, right? So this sort of idea that you're not paying for the content, but you're getting answers. And then you reward people for giving you earned content, or you reward people for listening in some way and responding to you. So in a lot of ways, what Foursquare was being used for was more for the rewarding, but almost like rewarding for being a participant and not really listening so much. So this is something I want to talk a little bit more about. There were definitely power control issues around the listening and responding part. So the rewarding was just kind of like, yeah, I guess we'll reward you for being an active customer that might carry on to other platforms. Um, but there were definitely some issues of power and control that happened around when vendors thought that they were doing something good by responding and when they thought that listening was OK. So here's a quote. I'm going to read you actually the longer version as well. Um, but this is a quote from uh, another regional chain, a different one. And she was talking about when she responded or retweeted somebody's um, message that they posted. And this doesn't really have to do with the location-based system in general, but I think this is something that elaborates a little bit on what that method of listening and responding is and what are the power relations around that. So she says, they were like, this store sucks. They forgot my guacamole. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like that. So I retweeted it. I was like, yeah, we do suck. And then they were embarrassed. They didn't realize that tweet was just seen by 6,000 people. A lot of people don't know that I'm looking at their tweets. We did some focus groups about a month ago, and they're like, it's crazy. Whenever I tweet about this store, they always write back. I never knew that somebody paid enough attention. People are constantly surprised. They'll be really dramatic and talk about how we ruined their day because we forgot the tofu in their bowl. And then we write back, and they're like, no, no, no. It was probably my fault. I might not have said tofu. It's just like that type of thing. So what we could get out of here is a couple different things. One is that there is um, an unexpected audience for the sort of responses that you're posting on Twitter and Facebook and things like that. And also Foursquare tips, right? So one of the things that my customers were saying, or, or the, the participants were saying, is that if people listen to them in the form of an eavesdropper, that's OK. So if vendors were to go on and they listen to what is being said, but they never respond, so you never know that you're being heard by them, that's totally fine. They could do that all they want. So that sort of monitoring is OK. But once they respond, and once they recognize that they've been monitoring you and listening to you, that's not OK. So the way that I'm kind of figuring that to be or playing around with is that is an issue of power and control. That there is this perceived control over the way that both location and conversations happen over these systems. And then because there's this mantra within the vendor's relationship to social media that, and this was repeated many, many times by the vendors, that they're losing control to audiences. That their brand is dissipating out of their hands and being put in the hands of the people who are active participants on SNS systems and on LBS systems. So with that in mind, they're kind of responding to these people in order to get control back, is what I think is happening. So um, they have the unexpected audience responding to you in a way that you're uncomfortable with because you thought that they were just eavesdropping, which was OK, in order to sort of take power back from you in some way as well. And here is another example. Of, or not another example of eavesdropping, but I also wanted to question, well, why are you responding, right? And one of the reasons was that, well, kind of we're being told to in some way. But also, why are you looking in the first place? What are you hoping to gain from monitoring specifically check-ins at any given location, but also maybe tweets um, that are linked to a four-score check-in or something like that? And what I got was something that was very interesting. So this is from a smaller non-regional chain, but something that has a place that has various locations 
locations. And she was saying that her reason for looking at check-ins, her reason for looking at things was it's to know more about our membership base. I think some of it's beca is because with my new, I've been in this position for three years, I'm on the desk less now that I do social media stuff. Every time we add more marketing stuff to my plate, I guess less desk shifts. Right now, this week, I only work the desk once. The rest of the time, I'm in the office. I used to work at the desk checking people in a couple times a week. So kind of those online interactions are one of my only ways to really, really gauge and interact with the membership. So having it, being able to see those analytics and that information and find out more about everybody is kind of my way to stay in touch with who are the members that I'm marketing to? So this idea that as companies get bigger, or as you expand, or as you gain a social media marketing manager who is not so involved at the point of sale, you have to monitor the point of sale. So one of the things that starts happening with these location-based systems in particular is that, um, and also other SNS, other social networking sites, is that your check-ins, your status updates, anything that you have um, that the kind of like demonstrates your interaction with the point of sale is being monitored and that's desirable. So it's not so much that the vendors are looking at you and your personal information and profiling you, especially over Foursquare, but they're using your check-ins to kind of monitor themselves. They're monitoring what they consider still the most important point which it, of brand interaction, of um, marketing interaction, which is the cashier. So a lot of people were repeating to me, well, you know, not, I'm not so interested in what you're doing, but I'm employing you as an observer of myself. So again, users are using this for self-quantification, and so are managers in some way. They're using it as a way to, again, gain control over their brand as their brand kind of moves seemingly further out of their hands. And now kind of moving into privacy debates a little bit, I wanted to bring up the fact that um, privacy debates in the eyes of the um, vendors are very different from the privacy debates in the eyes of the consumers. So this quote that I have here was taken from um, an instance where I was at a social media um, panel and they asked, you know, do, who has privacy concerns in this crowd? Please raise your hand. And the woman was kind of surprised that so many people raised their hand. And she said, well, I thought we were past this. I thought this was something that was passe, right? We're all sharing location, which then means, well, we're probably not concerned. So this is just another moment where we see this kind of diverging conflict between what vendors think and what consumers are feeling about privacy in particular. So what we see here then are other um, instances, or what I saw were other instances where privacy came up as an issue, but um, only for customers and not really for vendors. So vendors are very much operating under the assumption that if somebody is making something public through these social networking sites, that it's accessible for me, especially because my justification becomes that I'm responding to you, I have to listen to you in order to respond, but also that um, if it's out there, if you're using these social networking sites, then um, if you're using these social networking sites, then it's open to anyone to see. And I'm using this in the service of making your service more personalized. So it's really ultimately a, a benefit for you. So we have these sort of mantras that have been repeated over and over again in other f people's findings about Facebook and things like that, is that if it's open, if it's online, if it's accessible, then um, I, as a vendor or whoever, can have access to it. But what I found particularly important, aside from these things that we've heard in other studies, is that customers definitely have an imagined illusion or illusion of control. They feel like they have a lot of control over the way that their location is used and over the way that they're expressing or disclosing their location. And this happens through a variety of ways. So one, through the technological settings. They feel in particular on Foursquare that the technological settings and the privacy controls are made very clear to them. It's on the front page. They know how to use them. They feel like they have a sense of how that works. Even the very casual users felt OK. They felt like their information was pretty locked down, is what they were saying. Um, there's also social interactions that allow them to feel like they have control over the system as well. So one of the main things that was brought up was that they kind of use their network, that moment of people asking to be their friend, as a moment to assess who is okay to listen to my 
check-ins or who is okay to have access to me in that way. And they use that as a screening process, right? So they're thinking about location even on Facebook, even on Twitter requests and things like that. Do I feel okay about this person accessing my information? And an important moment, I think, too, was the way that they envisioned location to speak about themselves, right? So a lot of people match this up to their identity in some way, other goals that mediated across a lot of different social networking sites. But location was read very much as a signal, a signal of not just personal presence or physical presence, but also of you if you were available or not, if um, you wanted to meet up, if you were at work, if you were um, doing something that was non-routine, right? And people understood place even though it was somewhat vague, as the signal of expression, right? They were expressing themselves through place and that they expected people to be able to read place in a certain way. So if I checked into a fancy restaurant, this was a thing that was used a lot, an example that was used a lot, people would assume that somebody knew not to meet up with them, that they knew that maybe they were on a date, they knew that they weren't to be disturbed. So there was that sort of moment where there was something very specific about signaling through place to other people. But at the same time, place was perceived, or announcement of place was perceived as obscurity. Like it had a certain level of obscurity in some sense. So this idea mostly came from the fact that, well, I could check in somewhere, but they don't know what I'm doing there. And that gives me some sense of power. That gives me some sense of power or control over how um, my location was being used. Right? So even if you know where I physically am, um, you don't know what I'm doing there. You don't know why I'm there. There's so much more to know. right? And I feel OK about announcing that. People were also using location announcement as a shield against providing other sorts of information that they thought were more private. So I have a quote um, from someone who says, it's not actually two different people. It's personal, but it's not as personal as who I'm dating. So if I announce my location, maybe I don't have to announce who I'm dating. right? I'm giving somebody some seemingly intimate personal information, and then I could withhold other things. Um, somebody else said, I found that the more I put up there willingly, the less likely people were really were ready or willing or whatever to pry into it. And he pointed to location as a way that it seemed like he was expressing something private, but really he didn't think of it as that sort of personal. But at the same time, people thought of it as a very intimate sort of thing to announce. So at the same time that they saw location as public and could be easily figured out from some other system, they felt that it was something that they were giving people permission to access, and that was very important to them. So if somebody were to respond and say, well, what are you doing there, they wouldn't always answer. So with this shout or commenting function, the power to sort of withhold the actual meaning of that location was something that they valued and something that they didn't want to give up. Um, another thing to that came up with privacy or unwanted audience or undesired audience, um, things that my customers were saying or my participants were saying was that on Foursquare there's not really any feedback. That was one thing that they pointed to a lot, although that's slightly changing, right? There was no two-way flow. That they would check in and they wouldn't know who was looking at it. Um, but because they didn't actually claim rewards or because they didn't actually talk to anybody at the venues that they were checking in, in their imagination of who their community was, there were no vendors. It was just their network in some way. Um, and they weren't necessarily getting feedback from other people. But they still never envisioned a vendor within that system. And when I asked them explicitly, they would say no. So this idea that they're not sure if there's anyone behind that curtain on Foursquare, but at the same assumption, at the same time, they assumed that people were listening, even if they weren't responding, and that was OK. The one exception to this rule was actually the digital out-of-home services, which came up a lot on the part of vendors and participants. And these are things like Tweetcast or Barcast, where you have um, your check-in or your Twitter feed or something like that taken out of context and projected on a screen within that space. And they would talk about that as not exactly a violation of privacy, but something that made them very uncomfortable, that they didn't really like it when um, something was taken off their handheld and put or taken off of that pre-selected online space and broadcasted to a physical environment where people could then see their reaction to it or see them and match them with what was being said. So again, this sort of taking out of context becomes very important for them as well. And then the final thing I want to talk a little bit about, and again, I think there's a lot more I could say about the other categories too, but um, something that I'm still playing with is, well, what exactly is the relationship between physical and online interaction, and how did the two flow together or disconnect? So one of the things that came up um, pretty frequently among both casual users and heavy users was that uh, physical interaction 
based on online presence and common interest was okay between vendors and customers, which I found particularly interesting considering that everything up until this point was, well, it's not okay if somebody sees something that's not intended for them or responds to something when they should just be listening. So this idea that it was okay for certain people to have, if they were very interested in uh, food, for example, or restaurants, right, to have some sort of restaurant manager at a place that they frequented over time come up to them and say, hey, thanks for being here. That's so great. I saw that you checked in was perfectly fine. But at the same time, this was very different for um, crossing boundaries with customers. So here's a quote from one of the uh, just everyday customer participants. He's actually a pretty heavy gamer as well. And he was talking about a time where he was sitting in a restaurant bar and he lost his mayorship to somebody else. And he was really pissed off because this woman checked in right before he got there. And so he walked in and he went up to her and was like, where is she? Where is she? Because he saw her picture on the thing, finds her, went, goes up to her, shakes her hand and says something like, congratulations, Miss Mayor, like you beat me, right? I think she was a little weirded out by that. I don't know. Some people are really weirded out by strangers walking up to them and being like, ah, I know something about you that you didn't know I knew. Or maybe she hadn't considered while well, you're playing a very public game. So this crossover from the online space of um, Foursquare to the physical space, there was a huge disconnection. It actually weirded her out. And he said, I think I scarred her. I hadn't seen her. I didn't see her on Foursquare anymore after that. But when we saw each other in public, we did kind of awkwardly wave. So what this says to me, at least at first, is that the idea of like Milgram's familiar strangers is maintained. Right? So this idea that you have these people that you see all the time, they're familiar to you, yet they're strangers. You never actually speak to them. You never actually interact with them. This idea of street sociability is maintained across the online to physical interaction. That these people that you're kind of communing with in some way or that you feel like you're communing with online when you're playing this game who are not part of your pre-selected network don't become any more than familiar strangers when they cross over. But I think there's still something more there that we could talk about a little bit more. And then finally, the last um, moment that I want to draw attention to is uh, that a lot of people noted the physical relationship to place doesn't translate well into online space. So some of the examples of this were um, this idea that I've been hanging out in this place so, so much that I'm actually the person who's here the most. But And I do use Foursquare, but Foursquare doesn't verify that for me. Foursquare doesn't give me this sort of sense of ownership that I feel that I have. right? So I'm not the mayor on Foursquare, but I feel that I'm the mayor in this space. And I've been told by the owners that I'm the mayor in some way, but it doesn't reflect that at all. Um, another moment where this kind of happened was, I think, I think I only think about, oh, she was talking about how the physical and online kind of work together. And she was saying that um, she feels that there's something about checking in with someone at the same moment that is very meaningful, even though we would be together in this space if it wasn't for Foursquare as well. So this idea that there is some sort of extra value of announcing that you're with somebody in some way within social networks that I think is not just about bragging or showing off or making social connection, but I think it is some, saying something about the crossover between physical and um, online space. And I think I'm going to kind of stop there. I went way over time. I didn't realize that. But um, what does this mean for location-based systems? I think that we're at this moment of divergence or the splintering of the market in some ways, that um, people are moving towards catering to vendors and including them in these location-based services when customers don't really want them there. That maybe we would do better to kind of split it up a little bit more and have these sort of gaming systems or have some sort of indicator um, on the part of the customer to t alert the vendor to say, hey, this is when I want you to listen. Let me signal to you that I want you to hear and respond to what I'm saying because this is directed towards you. Um, social media and relationships of power. I definitely think that there's something to be further investigated with this idea of responding back to uh, customers when you're supposed to be just listening is what they were expecting to see. And state of privacy, I think there is something to say about context here, which I haven't quite figured out, but this idea of contextual integrity, this idea that maybe uh, all the parties involved don't know about each other, and then they also have different perceptions of what the context is to begin with. So the transmission principles that Nissan Mom talks about um, are very vague at best. So that's something to consider as well, but I'll stop there. Thank you.